Joining our conversation now is Jeff Sherman, Deputy CIO at Double Line Capital. And of course, you're not an equity guy. Um, what do you make of the outperformance of fixed income in terms of in ETF terms? So yeah, I mean, looking at, at the chart there, what I, what I see there is essentially what we had the low in yields once again, right? For, if you look at where that bottom, that chart right there, what I see is that was post the uh, banking crisis that we saw, we saw a big rally in yields. And so yields have been marching upwards, albeit they've stalled as of late, um, you know, especially on the back end of the curve on 10s and 30s. Uh, but I think some of that is just seeing negative returns in the short term over fixed income. And it, it is still a FOMO trade as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen activity at Double Line. Uh, we've seen flows uh, both on the mutual fund and ETF side uh, into our fixed income ETFs as well as our equity ETFs. So uh, in general, I think we're seeing flows across the board as people are reassessing risk profiles. We had a massive run in the, in the queues, as, as Eric was pointing out, uh, as well. And so you're starting to see some of that kind of people look to allocate elsewhere today. It feels like all of this comes back to the Fed, that this is still a very macro-driven market across asset classes. And when you think about you know equity ETFs maybe starting to overtake the inflows into bond ETFs, a lot of that ties back to this idea that maybe the Fed is finally done, that maybe we saw the last rate hike, even though we've heard to the contrary from Jerome Powell himself. What's the double line view on where the Fed goes from here and what that means for risk assets? Yeah, I, I think it, it's very tough to call right now. I mean, we think the Fed should be done at this point in time. Let's uh, let's continue the pause for an, uh, at least throughout the summer uh, to let the market digest what's happened thus far. And so the old saying in the, in the market is that the Fed hikes until something breaks. And we did see a break in the system back in March, right? Uh, we saw what it did to some of the banking system. And so we haven't really seen the ramifications of all that yet. And so I find it curious to see not only Jay Powell, but the majority of Fed governors who vote for the dot plot say that rates should be at least 50 basis points higher before the end of the year. And so I think some of that, you, know, you set a pause in the, in, in the rate hiking cycle leading to equity flows. I think maybe potentially some investors are thinking that you're going to see negative performance in bonds because rates continue to push up. But at this stage, what we've seen is that Again, 500 basis points is a lot. I think we all agree with that. And I think just the longer that the Fed stays at this level, I think it continues to put pressure on the banking system. It wakes people up to realize they're not getting market rates in their deposits. And look, Janet Yellen will sell you T-bills all day long with a five <laughs> handle on them, right? And she needs to, right? They've been replenishing the TGA as well. But if you look at the back end of the curve, 10-year Treasury is roughly in the range it's been in for the last like seven plus months, right? Since mid-November at least. And so ultimately, as a bond investor, what that means, if you'd have bought this seven months ago, yields haven't changed, you've had a little bit of volatility, but you've earned carry the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what people are realizing too, look at how deeply inverted the curve is, whether you use twos, tens, you use three month T-bills to tens, we're getting back to these extreme levels again. And so to me, it signals that there's a nervousness with the bond market and that investors are saying that given the macroeconomic data, maybe it makes sense to allocate to some of these longer dated bonds. I wanna get more into that, where we are in the cycle, because there's a Fed paper out now saying the share of non-financial firms in financial distress has reached a level that's higher than during most of the previous tightening episodes since the 70s. So what does that mean for you or that portfolio? Jeff Sherman here with us. We're going to zero in on the corporate credit market next. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. Katie, let's get back to Double Lines uh, Deputy CIO Jeff Sherman talking to us about their portfolio and um, the effects of uh, the tightened monetary monetary policy and, and really a higher uh, share of non-financial firms failing. H how do you look at that? Is a recession imminent? I don't know if it's imminent, but it definitely seems in the cards of the next 12 months. I mean, if you look at the macroeconomic indicators, you know, pick your favorite one. Um, I, I can only find two uh, indicators that I follow that are showing still signs of life in the economy. And I, I see some horrific prints and things like the LEI. Right. What, what, what are they? Oh, you want the positive. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the positive things are ISM services. Um, they're still expanding. Uh, unfortunately, they're expanding at a very slow rate at this point. But that is one of the things, given we're a service-based economy, that's a strong indicator. And it's somewhat contemporaneous, right? It's not massively lagged. And then you have the labor market, which we know is notoriously a lagged variable. And so the labor market seems to be continuing to deliver, at least on the smaller medium enterprise and some of the service areas. We always see the large
large cap names are, are having significant layoffs at this point. So uh, I don't get too excited about labor at this point, just given it's late in the cycle. Uh, but you're talking about you know some of the stress in the marketplace. I think the, the biggest place that's seeing this today is a leveraged loan market. And not shockingly, it is a floating rate asset. And so when you think about the buildup of debt, well, all of a sudden, you have 500 basis points more on coupon because they reset off of SOFR, which is key to the Fed funds rate. But if you think about investment-grade corporate bonds or high-yield bonds, well, the bulk of this stuff got refinanced back in 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. So that weighted average cost of capital of these firms is still relatively low, right? So if you don't have a need to come to the market, it's extremely low. And so there's a reason you're seeing this divergence between the lower quality loan names and some of the lower quality high yield is because those actually haven't had to reset yet. But for those that are trafficking in these markets, you know, we prefer a, a higher quality. Look, I'm okay with some single B risk in the portfolio and double B because, again, some of this stuff ultimately, you know, it doesn't have pressure on it, right? And so this is what happens when you have a rapid hiking cycle and these 500 basis points aren't in all parts of the economy today. We've seen it in housing, right? We see it in loans. And I, I, if I'm most concerned about a part of the market that's showing stress, it is the leveraged loan market. Well, I want to talk specifically about high yield because we've been trying to compare maybe this recession that's coming to past recessions. We heard uh, some really interesting comments from Michael Collins over at PGM last week. Let's take a listen. The mistake a lot of uh, folks are making, Lisa, is they're looking at all the historical relationships, right? And they're looking at high yield spreads in a typical recession go out to 800 basis points or 1,000 basis points. And in today's world, that would be a 15% yield, right, which is which is kind of Armageddon. They expect high yield defaults to hit 10%. Uh, that's because they're looking at the old models, looking at some of the past recessions where you had a lot of leverage, where you had a lot of excesses and credit buildups. You do not not have that now. So so our, our mantra is, you know, 600 spread on the high yield market is the new 800, right? If you get into the fives, you're buying high yield. So 600 basis points is the new 800 basis points, 500 basis points. Sounds like Michael Collins is buying five uh, high yield. We're at 430 right now. What's your thinking on basically the valuations in high yield? Yeah, I think 600 is a buy. I think 800 is more this recession. And I, I don't think there's a new model out there. At the end of the day, you're pricing default risk, right? Um, but I think it stems back. And I think where Michael could be right here is what we just talked about, right? If the recession happens right now today, if it's imminent, it right now, these companies don't have to refinance the debt. The wall, the maturity wall, as we call it, is extended out at least another year, if not 18 plus months. And so usually it's those maturity walls that cause a default cycle, right? Because the debt has to roll over. And when does it roll over? It roll, or what does it roll over? It rolls over at market rates, right? So you have these companies right now that are paying a below market rate because, again, they issued the debt uh, 18 months to, to like 30 months ago. And so ultimately, I think, you know, there's a reason that there's this pressure in spreads and spreads are tighter than they are well, usually at this point in the cycle. Uh, but again, I think that at the end of the day, if you start to see the recession, you start to see more of this stuff, you're going to get a spread widening. And just look at the last episode of spread widening and high yield. It went on 100 in like two weeks, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I don't get excited about 430. 430 to me is not a level to buy. It's a level to re-sculpt a portfolio and maybe move up in quality a little bit. But look, if he's going to hide out in triple, uh, I'm sorry, double B's in that area. Yeah, but they're very tight spreads. You, you have a 300 handle, right? So ultimately, I, I think that there, there is no new mantra in the world today. You've got to look at spreads. And ultimately, the higher that cash stays, the higher yield say that people will look at that and say, look, is eight and eight, eight and a half yield or 830 yield today? Is that enough to really take default risk when I can get these T-bills at five and a half percent? Perfect segue. There is a uh, ETF out there, XCCC, which is all triple C. That is yielding 14%. So, you know, tell me why someone like me shouldn't just put one or two percent of my portfolio in this. Because look at the spread there. Yeah. Isn't that enough? Well, 14% yield uh, isn't enough spread, I would say today. And it depends. I mean, ultimately, triple C's usually have a 20 handle in a recession, right? And so, what does that mean? Repricing. Okay, you know, it's a if it's a three to five year asset, you're talking 
talking about being down 20, 25% on that. So your carry helps you some, Eric, but it doesn't get you through it. Secondly, if you look historically, the, the, when you talk about triple C, the way that the raids agencies view that is that it has like an 85% probability of default over the next five years. <laughs> so it's all about trading, Eric. I know you're a good trader. So again, if you want to put on the trade, that's great. But if you like that and you think there's not a default environment, I got a better one for you. I don't, it's not, I don't know about an ETF on it, but it's the triple C bank loan market. Today it has a 20 handle yield on it, wow. right? You know why? No one thinks you're getting 20 over the full cycle of those loans, <laughs> right? So you're going to have to have a good lawyer. You're going to have a good workout. But again, if you want to trade it, feel free. All right. Maybe we'll keep an eye out for the double line version of that uh, trade there. But Jeff, really appreciate it. That is Jeff Sherman, Deputy CIO over at Double Line.